Hello and welcome to Daily Politics on Trust TV. On this program, we discuss issues around politics, policy, and governance. I am Shapiu Suleiman. Today on the platform, we'll be engaging uh, some top spokespersons uh, of the major political parties in Nigeria. Now, as the presidential hopefuls are set to engage Nigerians with another round of electoral promises to get their electoral mandate next year, we engage spokespersons of the two major political parties, talking about the APC and the PDP. We examine their political, economic, and moral standings to give Nigerians a better perspective on what to expect in the coming days with regards to their preparations or otherwise for the top job. We do this while minding the views of some Nigerians that the two major contenders who largely share similarities in political tutelage, years of experience, and even some of the baggages. And joining us for this conversation are the spokesperson for the campaign council for both the ruling APC and the major opposition PDP, talking about Professors Kayamu S.A.N. and Mr. Daniel Boala. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Now, let's take a quick break, uh, after which the conversation commences. Stay with us. Thank you very much for staying with us. And today we're looking at 2023, the APC, PDP, and of course, Nigerians. And just like I said earlier on, we have the spokespersons for the two major political parties campaign councils, that of the PDP, uh, Mr. Daniel Buala, and the APC, talking about Barista uh, Professor Kayamu, uh, SAN. Now let's go straight to Daniel Buala, uh, who will be uh, giving us his perspectives uh, on the issues. Uh, Mr. Buala, if you're there, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Okay. Um, let's start um, by, I mean, from, from the lighter note now. Uh, the fact that uh, you've joined now the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, uh, before now, so a couple of days ago, you were with the ruling APC. And uh, at some point, you also, um, I mean, you were quoted to have said that uh, the APC uh, is actually a marketable political party. Uh, and now you happen to be on the other side of the divide, perhaps uh, tasked with the responsibility of uh, demarketing this same political party. How would you? Um, you know, handle this very uh, tasking uh, assignment? Well, I will give you a very simple uh, example. Uh, we, for those of us who are married, at one time when we were preparing for marriage, we went into a relationship with our supposed fiancés that we thought we were going to build a family with. In the course of the relationship, we discovered it wasn't going to work because we had differences. We changed our mind and then we change direction. We eventually have found our spouses. We got married and we're happily married. Uh, sometimes people also exercise their right according to the constitution to change even their religion. Sometimes somebody goes to a school, he's studying a course in a particular school and suddenly he realizes that the course model that is taught maybe is not fashioned in the way he wanted. He changes schools and he completes his studies. It is to be viewed from this simplistic point of view. Yes, I supported uh, APC. Yes, I've been uh, in APC for seven years and I defended APC because constitutionally it is a right of every citizen to associate with a, any group, 
in this case, political party, and to advance the cause and belief system of that political party. But in the same way, when the belief system at some point does not go or go well with you, you have a right to change party. Now, if you have a chance, if you have a right to change, even when there is no reason to, to give, how much more when you have a reason? For me, I changed because the party made a decision that I considered run contrary to my core belief about diversity. And uh, if you come to the rest of the world, you will see that even in employment now, you have to reflect as an employer what they call the, you have to pass a diversity scale to show that in your employability, you recognize diversity. So I felt that uh, it did not go well. And since I was promised by the flag bearer, I was going to play a role of a marketer. I felt I couldn't um, continue to stay to market what I didn't uh, believe in. And so I decided to change, but I didn't want to make it a drama because it's a personal decision. It may apply differently to another Christian elsewhere. And after that, I moved on. Unfortunately, some people felt that they could feed off of that and have continued to keep hitting on that as though that is the core reason why APC should not be voted for. Now, after I left, thankfully, I was appointed as a spokesman now for PDP. But if you recall, even from the way you put in what looked like your poster, you say spokesperson for Atiku presidential campaign. That means it's about Atiku, it's about his presidential campaign, it's about PDP, it's not about me. So that is why the focus now going forward, it's about the Atiku campaign. Except of course, if you don't believe that somebody has a right to change direction in the course of his political activities. So much more, you talked about the reason, talking about um, you know, your moral suasion and of course your understanding of how to manage diversity. Uh, but some will say, what make it different from what uh, you are currently marketing? Because if you are actually um, you left because of the, uh, the, the, the same fee ticket, for instance. Uh, your principle also happened to emerge against, you know, uh, the earlier notion that uh, the PDP ticket will go to the south. Uh, and perhaps uh, even against, some would say, the party, um, part of the, uh, the PDP um, guidelines, if you like. How would you respond to that? Okay, so uh, in the case of that, first of all, the decisions were made before I joined. But as a uh, politician, I'm not, uh, I'm not unaware of those facts. PDP as a political party, there were certain agitation amongst them at the beginning that power must be zoned to the South. Some of them invoke the provisions of their constitution to say that there is ground for the zoning of the party. The way they agreed is that if you have rule, then the next person to rule should be from another side. Now, but because of that conflict amongst themselves as to whether it should be zoned or not, it is my understanding that I think two separate sets of committees were formed to look into it and then come up with recommendations. The committee comprised of politicians in the party from across the country. All the two committees came up with a finding or a conclusion that it should be thrown open for contest. And so it was thrown open for, for contest and there was participation by everyone from the South and from the North. And uh, the same way that there was participation, it could have gone either way. But in this case, thankfully it went in the way of Atiku Abubakar. So as far as that one is concerned, you, there is no problem of diversity. There is no problem of lack of inclusion. Now, if in case if you want to contrast it, with APC, in the case of APC, there was no committee formed to look into the choice of the vice president picking, I mean, into the choice of a flag bearer picking a vice president because it is his prerogative. So there was no committee that you could say there was a committee where they reach a finding and why are you leaving? No, no committee. And even if there was a committee and they reach a finding, it still would not have stopped me from making a personal decision. So in this case, as you are reflecting it to PDP, if somebody in PDP does not think that the procedure they follow and arrive at Atiku Abubakar, he has a right to exercise uh, his right. So it was a personal decision. But what is most important, I think we should look at is the situation we face as a country. You see, the country is in a precipice. We're heading towards a point where you call existential direction. Few days ago, Avash from World Bank said that Nigerians, Nigerian economy is heading towards the precipice unless we revamp our tax system, we take our first subsidy and do certain regulatory changes. That is World Bank. 
Okay. You can now see today there was a report that the inflation had risen to a 17-year all-time all-time high, mm -hmm. going into what what uh, percentage? I think about 19.64 yeah. as at July. Yeah. The previous time it was 18.60. Mm. So what it shows is that our economy is declining. If you look at the CPI, the indices are not good. Some of the people in PDP have given the excuse that the reason why there is high inflation and the cost of living is high in Nigeria, it is because it is either connected to COVID or it is connected to the Russian-Ukraine war. Yeah. I did a research and I discovered that that isn't the truth because the crisis I, 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 in you, Russia uh, and Ukraine... Mm. Mr. Bola, you I, wanted to say I, something? Say, yeah, are you saying that uh, you know, the Nigerian economy is insulated from this... Uh, global shocks that we're talking about because if yes you talk about inflation which um, you know some would say you know food inflation generally um, but it is also being witnessed uh, in other economies uh, so it is not uh, I mean exclusive to Nigeria no apples and oranges are not the same and let me just tell you an example the crisis in Russia the crisis between Russia and Ukraine affected the European countries and inflation hit European countries. Why? Because most of the countries in Europe were beneficiaries of energy and gas from Russia. And most of their food products also came from Ukraine and some parts from Russia. So because of this crisis, there were short supply and a high demand. And that created a situation of inflation in the European countries. It is not, you don't apply that to Nigeria because it has been documented that the crisis in between Russia and Ukraine has added to an increase in the oil in the international market. In other words, the crisis in Russia is supposed to benefit us economically because now we are having increase in the oil price at the, on the, at the international market. In fact, it is even projected that if this crisis continues, then by December of this year, the oil at the international market will sell between $150 to $200 per, uh, $200 per barrel. So the crisis, and then secondly, we are not importing food products from Ukraine or from Russia. And that what is happening, even run contrary to the assertion by PDP that, because they make the case that we, we, are, we, we, we are able to I'm reach full to sufficiency, yeah, what they I'm call self-sufficiency. Yeah. So if we have reached self-sufficiency, mm. then what it means is that the food production that we have been able to you know, generate should have been able to deal with the situation, the situation of inflation, because mm -hmm. one of the indices of food sufficiency is that it brings stable prices in the market, or even the prices of items will go down. You can see the paradoxical application of economic, uh, you know, skills by the PDP, uh, by the APC. Sorry, sorry, by the mm -hmm. APC, mm -hmm. which clearly right. suggests that the APC isn't getting it right, and okay. it is not enough to keep blaming mm -hmm. the international. Or, or mm. a, a crisis between Russia and Ukraine, or even okay. the COVID. Okay, you talked about the boom, perhaps as a result of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Um, but what the current administration uh, keeps saying is that uh, the genesis of the whole problem about Nigeria's economy was actually a legacy from the PDP, for instance. Uh, this is a party, or this is a, yes, this is a party which has successive governments uh, having, you know, um, significant percentage of oil uh, um, uh, revenue uh, ranging from 140 to 180 dollars a barrel, for instance, at some point, and there hasn't been enough, you know, savings uh, to cater for any days like this. Uh, and then uh, you turn out to blame the current administration of uh, inability to manage, you know, the crisis it found itself, uh, in, in, you know. In, uh, in addition to the global challenges that the, the economy is facing. Um, how would you so, insulate so, so, the PDP from the, uh, the trajectory, you know, I mean, the declining economy? So you see, that is another business excuse that they give as an argument, that they inherited this, they inherited that, they inherited this, they inherited. Remember in 1999, when democracy returned and PDP, uh, PDP came into government, we took over from military. And if you follow the world report as at that time, the kind of economic hardship that fell on Nigeria, befell Nigeria because of military interregnum, it was so harsh. When Obasanjo and Atiku came on board, they were never given those excuses because the hallmark of a leader is accepting responsibility. It is not giving excuses. It is people that will see while you're working that they will then begin to build defenses for you, but you are not supposed to do that. And besides, 
we are talking about getting to the eight years. So that means they have had the opportunity within these two terms to be able, even if they started from the scratch, to be able to do something so that Nigerians will say they are, they are able to bring us out of the quagmire. Because you can so you keep giving the excuses for the first two terms and give, keep giving excuses for the next person that will come. Excuses has been characterized with almost about everything that they do. But in this case, there is no room for excuses. There's no room for excuse. What would, uh, for instance, a PDP government do differently? Now that uh, your principal is, um, um, I mean, aspiring, you know, to, uh, to lead the country and he's probably going to meet up, uh, you know, this economic uh, indices that we're talking about, rising inflation, you know, uh, I mean, falling standards, uh, value of the Naira, you know, rising unemployment and what have you. How would PDP, for instance, reverse this trend, you know, if it has the magic wand? So that is why I think the only presidential candidate that has come up with clearly defined manifesto or agenda, what he calls my covenant with Nigerians. They are fivefold. Let me first talk about it. And, and they are interrelated because national security and national interest is interwoven. You don't isolate it. So, for example, he has a plan to revamp our educational system so that we can elevate this country from through the, through the means of education, we elevate this country to what we call a knowledge-based economy, where you tap into the resources of people because it has been recorded or it has been agreed globally that what has been discovered from above the neck is far better than what is below the leg. It means when you have a knowledge-based economy, you can always outsmart and do better than the natural resources. And he intends to do that in the education by advising the state and giving them all the necessary step, uh, uh, all the necessary support for them to introduce course models that are problem solving, akin to the American system of teaching. He believes that this strike, lingering strike, which is a proof of irresponsibility of APC, he believes that we will not allow ASU to ever get to a point where stri strike will last this long. There will always be differences. But if education is prioritized in your government, some of this waste in other areas of government, you could have dealt with those situations and deal with the issue. This evening, I was listening to the people from us, what they were saying. It is quite touching because the cyclical effect of the strike is that these young people that are at home are continuing to give sleepless nights to their parents, and they are also vulnerable to participating in certain crimes. He wants to also bring about what we call revamping of the economy by producing, for example, alternative energy. We are looking at, we are only looking at one source of energy. We are able to generate that more than we're able to distribute. It means we have a problem of distribution. He has engaged experts to come up with a broad-based idea on how we can tap into alternative source of energy. And we're beginning to get one or two uh, suggestions from the expert. He also wants, to, probably when we have time, I'll talk more on that. He also wants to look at unifying the country. When you hear somebody say, I bear true faith and allegiance to the Republic, it means the person can die for the country. Right. But the person can only do that when the person has faith that the country thinks of him and the country prioritizes him. Yeah. When okay. a part of the country can feel that they are not mm -hmm. part of the country mm -hmm. because of either nepotism or a form or system of government that excludes them, in other words, exclusion, then you cannot mm -hmm. command the loyalty of the people. Look at Section 14 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. He wants okay. every part okay. of the country for yes, there to be integration talk... and yeah. creation of yeah. equal opportunities to everybody. Right. Okay. Thirdly, yeah. Before we talk about, you know, you raised two issues that I want to uh, want you to clarify. I understand your principal was right. talking about the, uh, you know, uh, ongoing ASU strike, and he said it would never happen under a PDP administration or uh, under his watch, for instance. Uh, but uh, you know, a quick look at the the the. I mean, the history, if you like, the recent history would indicate that uh, between 2000 and, uh, 1999 and 2001, there has been, you know, series of ASU strike uh, in, in, in just between these just two years. I mean, uh, within the two years, ASU went on strike twice, uh, first uh, 80 days and the first 90 days in the first instance, and then another 90 days, talking about 180 days. And in 2003, still under the Obasanjo Atiku regime, ASU went on strike for 180 days. Uh, some would say talk is cheap, you know, but uh, we've also forgotten the fact that, um, you know, at some point people were also um, saddled with the responsibility of uh, governance and, and they didn't do something, I mean, differently from what is happening today. How would you react to that? 
So first of all, a quick correction. He never said it will never happen. He said he will never allow the ASU strike to be example of that. I can ask you to ask Comrade Adams Oshomoni, who was the uh, Lord Lugard of, of uh, ASU strike and labor unionism at that time. I said ASU strike, sorry, labor unionism at that time. He was very blunt. He was very strong. He was very consistent in that. In all of those periods where they were striked, either by ASU or any of the labor unions around the time of PDP, they were the most important thing to consider, they were constructive engagement. Constructive engagement means an engagement where both parties are frank, both parties are honest, both parties are realistic. The argument that ASU is making is that on all occasions where there was a sit down, this present government will shift the goalpost on every given occasion. In fact, today, in one other TV station, he even opened up extensively to talk about those details of the information. So, and that is why he said the president had on several occasions given directive upon directive upon directive upon directive, and they have not been able to come up with a concrete result for the president to act upon it. So what, what that means is that there is no confidence developed within the two parties. And you remember it was not long ago one of the spokesmen of the party said that uh, they don't have time right. to carve out 1.1 trillion to deal with the issue of strike ASU because okay. if they did or okay. if they do, there are other branches of government or mm -hmm. educational institutions that are mm -hmm. also going to say they also want their demand, they want their demands to be met, mm -hmm. or else they will go on strike. Okay, we'll that take, to me uh, is irresponsibility. Why? Because well, uh, if you find yes, that Mr. Asus, Mr. Boyla, uh, problem we, we, is cogent and compelling. Yeah. Deal with it until the next person comes yes, and then Mr. you will Boyla, know what to do. But we, to say, we, I will not pay you because if I pay mm. you, other people are also going to ask for so, pay. Sorry to for me, the, it's not the way to go in yeah. dialogue. Okay, sorry for the interruption. I understand we have to take a break. Uh, perhaps also when we return, we'll be joining um, Barista Fesas Kayamo, SAN, uh, who will also be uh, responding to some of these issues uh, raised by the PDP spokesperson. Uh, we'll take a break. Uh, we'll be back shortly. Stay with us. Story. Thank you very much uh, for, st uh, for staying with us on Daily Politics. And today we're looking at 2023, APC, PDP, and of course, Nigerians. Uh, we've been interfacing with uh, uh, the spokesperson of the PDP Campaign Council talking about uh, Daniel Buala. And now we also have in the studio, uh, Barista Festus Keyamu, uh, a senior advocate of Nigeria and the current Minister of State uh, for labor and productivity. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Okay. I would also uh, start by getting your uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, I hope you can you can do this very quickly. Um, looking at Nigeria today, and of course the promises made by the APC government uh, in terms of reviving the economy, tackling corruption, and of course addressing insecurity. Some say your party or your government has failed in delivering these promises, uh, looking at the current realities. How would you, um, I mean, what would you say concerning this? Well, <laughs> the cliche that government has failed uh, has become um, a song that um, the opposition has virtually rammed down the throat of everybody mm. without looking at um, the details of what we have done, uh, mm. the statistics, and put them in a context. Um, what um, the opposition has done in the last few years is to memorize um, some high falutin words. Mm. And those are the high falutin words that the press they repeat. Mm. Government has failed. But we're not looking at the future. Security I, I has mean, collapsed. We're not looking at, yeah. The, these, are just the word, at these, the are, these are just phrases that are high falutin words. Okay, let's take but when we drag them, mm. we drag them to the details mm. 
You know, and that is what we want to do in this campaign. Oh. We don't want to go along with their scaremongering. Mm -hmm. Like um, I heard my younger brother and younger colleague said, uh, he was saying mm -hmm. about um, Asuna. When he began to yeah, ask yeah. him about to, the details of his strike under the PDB, right. to, yeah, before ran we away. go to the Asu issue, so let me, let let, me, let's, like, take, let, let's be specific on the, yes. on the promises, for instance. Yes. Uh, if we take insecure, addressing insecurity, for instance, yes. um, Nigerians are very much aware of uh, the Herculean task of the government um, tackling the issue of Boko Haram insurgency. But they are also um, worried that the current administration has allowed the insecurity to escalate, you know, beyond Boko Haram. We have multiplicity of security challenges that um, have put the country on the edge. How would you, I mean, what would you say with regards to this now, vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, achievement that was actually recorded? All right, so let us take it, you know, one by one. This mm -hmm. is actually what we want in these debates, mm -hmm. you know, leading up to the elections. Mm -hmm. What did we inherit? Mm -hmm. We inherited the Boko Haram problem. Mm -hmm. At that time, we inherited it. They had taken over more than 14 local governments in the Northeast mm -hmm. and hoisted their flags. Mm -hmm. We inherited the farmer's head as crisis. That had been on even before Basson just time. Mm -hmm. It had been a serious an problem. An existential It's okay. an existential problem. Mm. What have we done about those two problems? A club like El Kanemi Football Club mm. or Bornu State that were now playing, that were already playing their football matches mm. in Bauchi because of insecurity. Nobody could gather in one place mm. in Meduguri to watch any football match. Mm. Now El Kanemi Football Club is back to Meduguri playing their football matches. Mm. That is success recorded. Mm. Boko Haram has not been totally wiped out, but it has reduced significantly mm. because we constructively engaged our neighbors, Chad, Benin Republic, and um, uh, Niger Republic and Cameroon. Mm. The president, you remember at the point, went on some aggressive diplomatic shuttle when he came mm. because the first thing he realized that we mm. had to engage our neighbors in order to curtail this problem. Mm. PDP did not do that. Did you see Jonathan engage in those shuttle? That was the sense of a general he brought in. He knew exactly how to encycle these people. Mm. And so we pushed them back. We reduced them to almost nothing. Mm. Like I said the other time, I drove all the way with the governor mm. from Meduguri to all the way to Dambua. That stretch was an impassable stretch before. Yeah. And we, recently. Yeah. So I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Yes. Yeah, I'm coming to that. It before, has reduced significantly. Yeah, yeah. You it's, talk about yes. you know, how Boko Haram was able to carve some, I mean, yes. take over some territories and what have you, yes. hoisting a plug. Yes. Some would say the hoisting, hoisting a plug you know, by non state access is now commonplace. You find that happening in Kaduna, happening in Niger, happening. No, I'm talking in, about taking over so, the territory. Mm. Taking over the territory effectively. Hoisting a flag is just the, the symbol that we are now in charge. Oh, people just hoist the flags and run away these days. It's not that they are in charge of territory. But when, and the post yeah. I'm telling you that that was happening before in the Northeast. 14 local governments. There was a time, you remember that, they almost entered Damaturu, Yobe. Mm. There was a time flights were cut off from Gombe. You could not land in Gombe. For more than two, one year, Gombe fly, ask flights, they were not landing in Gombe. So people forget, maybe they see people forget these things. Okay. Now again, again, I'm talking about the other security problem, yeah. which is the farmer's headers problem. Yeah. Now, I want you to quote me quite correctly. I'm not yeah. saying these things are totally wiped out, yeah. but in, on the scale of what we met, yeah. and the scale of what is now, it has reduced significantly. Yeah. Now, other security problems reared their ugly heads. I want to admit, okay. and I want to admit correctly, mm -hmm. that as these problems were solved, were being solved, mm. you had a problem of banditry, that red is ugly head. Mm. And then the problems of kidnapping, they are red is ugly. In the northeast, in the northwest. But don't forget that kidnapping is also not strange to us. But because, it's strange because to, to, the there, northern part to those of the people, country, yes. Because there were time in the southeast mm -hmm. under under the PDP, mm -hmm. kidnapping reached its peak mm -hmm. in the southeast, if you remember at that time. Yeah. Now, this problem, like I said, yeah. when we met these other two problems, we did not, you know adopt a knee-jerk approach to these problems. Yeah. We but started and mapped out a response. Yeah. Hold on. We yeah. mapped, mapped out a response, mm -hmm. and they have been reduced significantly. Mm -hmm. Government is now in the process of addressing these other problems. Mm -hmm. But when 
The, when the opposition and the, the press keep parroting that phrase, government has failed, government mm. has failed, but if, we will not be here, hold on, mm. we will not be here, sitting down here, mm. if government has failed. Mm. So but, it but, is, but it here is, we are, you is, also it, it, admit it, the fact that it is the security situation it is has escalated beyond it what... It is scaremongering mm. to use those words. Mm. I was using, I was looking recently, and I want people to please mm. fact check me. I was re looking recently mm. at the World Terrorism Index. We have read, we have come down. We have gained significantly in the world terrorism index. But the problem, the problem is with government, the third most terrorized the problem, countries in the country in the but, world. But in terms after of movement, Afghanistan and and and, but, and Iraq. But in terms, yes, in, in, ter in terms of volume of terrorist so, activities, what, mm. in the terms of volume. Mm. You see, most of these things, it happen, you see, when you move up a scale, mm. you don't use the scale to measure because at times, some people, they gain faster than you. Mm. And so you'll be moving up a scale. Is, is whereas, a whereas you're making a gain. Because you're not listening to me. Yeah, you're not I'm, listening I'm, to yeah, me. I'm, I'm getting your point. Listen to my point first I'm making. Oh, okay. I said, when somebody moves up a scale, mm. it does not mean that you are reducing or increasing. Mm. It means that other activities around you, mm. perhaps, mm. is making you move up and down the scale. But you may have gained yourself. Mm. Nigeria has gained in terms of the volume of terrorist activities around it. Go and look at it. And fact check me. Mm. It's just that people around, other countries may have, may have moved mm. around the scale. And that is why we may have seemed to have moved up the scale. But in terms of volume of terrorist activities within our country, mm. and go and check the World Terrorism Index, mm. we have improved. So if I understand now, your position, the present administration now, has delivered on its promise to guarantee security of lives of properties we have not full, we, we have not completely done it. We are, it's a process. And let me t let you know, just see, mm. the mm. point is that you mm. frame your questions in order to Box yeah. me into an, no, a, a corner. Really. But let me tell you this. Mm. It is a work in progress. Okay. And I want to say this emphatically. No government finishes a job. Mm. Government is a continuum. Okay. You take it to a reasonable extent, and mm. the next government will continue from there. Right. Okay. That is what we're doing. Uh, okay, let's take a look at uh, economy, for instance. Uh, yeah. Just before you came, I mean, you, you started responding to the issues. You yeah. had... Uh, uh, Mr. Boala talking about, you know, the double-digit inflation. Uh, just recently, I mean, yesterday or so, uh, we are, we're about hitting 20% uh, inflation, you know, food inflation in Nigeria. And the indices are not palatable in the area of, uh, you know, uh, rising debt profile. We're talking about 41 trillion naira in the last, uh, since the, the assumption of this administration. We're talking about the valuation of the naira now exchanging at 680 to a dollar and things like that. Is it to say that you, you, you improve on the economy or you know, it got, it gotten worse you know, uh, than you met it? Now, let me answer this and without interrupting me. So let me say this. Mm. Now, I heard my, like I said, my brother, he tried to take Nigeria away mm. from the world, you know, uh, macroeconomic, you know, situation. Mm. And he said it's only happening in mm. Europe. Mm. That is very laughable. Hmm. Let us come to Africa. I'm not going to cite examples of Europe. Hmm. In North Africa, the most prominent economy in North Africa, the leader, hmm. that Egypt, hmm. and perhaps maybe Tunisia. Hmm. In, in um, East Africa, it is Kenya. In South Africa, it is South, in Southern Africa, it is South Africa. In West Africa, it is Nigeria. All of these various parts of Africa I'm talking about, I'm not citing Europe like he cited. Mm -hmm. They are doing, we are doing better than them in terms of, because mm. of world, world macroeconomic situations. Let me tell you what's happening in Egypt. Mm. Egypt, as I, speak, as I speak right now, they are in the throes of debt and they are almost running out of their staple food wheats. Mm. Ghana, mm. Tunisia is also in North Africa. They are doing 100% mm. to their of debt to their GDP ratio. Mm. That is what they are, that is what, not, that's what Tunisia is doing Nigeria now. Be comparing this, this, is, 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 about but I want to tell you what we are doing. I want to tell you what we are doing. Mm. You see, the debt you are talking about, mm. we are still doing 23%. Mm. And do you know what the World Bank said? The World Bank says it has set a limit of 55% mm. for countries around the world. Mm. And we have also imposed a, a, self, a, a limit of 40% on ourselves. Mm. Despite the World Bank limit of 55%, Nigeria has said we will not exceed 40%. But right now, we are doing 22% mm. of, of our, debt, our debt to GDP ratio. How, would so, you, yeah, how so, do you explain so, the value, so, for so, instance? L let's no, look at the in value. Ghana, Ghana, South mm. Africa, that mm. seems to be better than us, they mm. are doing 80%, far more than the World Bank mm. uh, 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 limit. Mm. Ghana is doing 70%. So you can see how well 
how well in the face of the shocks we have re we have witnessed around the world that we are doing how well we are doing mm -hmm. now i also want to address the issue of the fuel crisis the energy crisis mm -hmm. Yeah, the energy he crisis. talks about perhaps the need for you to take advantage of the current situation. No, Nigeria no. at the he moment, doesn't understand. That should we talking about? No, you know, that, that means he boom. doesn't understand how the mm. economy works mm. and what the more the prices of oil goes up now mm. around the world, the more our the byproducts go up in Nigeria because we are still import dependent. Mm. So he doesn't understand. But is that our we are still promise? import dependent. Our promise in 2015 see, was actually to see. build refineries. You know, at what? least. Uh, one every year. Have, you, have, have you seen the private refineries we have approved? Mm -hmm. This is, they, are, they don't, it's the next administration that will reap the benefits. Mm -hmm. That's why we are saying that we are trying to repair the damage they have done over the years. Mm -hmm. The ASO thing he's talking about, mm -hmm. what is the problem? What is the problem of ASO now? It is the 2009 agreement signed by PDP government. Mm -hmm. They went into an agreement with ASO that they could not fulfill agreements they could not fulfill mm -hmm. and so we had to inherit those agreements and we are struggling to renegotiate those agreements now imagine an irre how, how irresponsible can a government be mm -hmm. when they go into agreements with asu sign agreements sign conditions that they could not fulfill government could not fulfill mm -hmm. and that is what why asu is on strike so let us tell nigerians that asu is not on strike because apc signed an agreement with them it's the pdp that signed well, an Mr. agreement well, with them. between now about hold on let me finish shifting now blame, between you know. now i'm mm -hmm. not shifting blame I'm, it's a mm -hmm. reality Mm -hmm. we, are, we, are not, we are not saying come and do it. For, we are going to tackle the problem. Mm -hmm. Between 1999 and 2005-15 when they handed over, mm -hmm. ASU was on strike 12 times. I have the statistics, 12. And the 12 amounted to 900 days, almost 1,000 days mm -hmm. The ASU was on strike. And then they come, they say, talk, talk is cheap. And they say, Atiku says, I want to tackle. He was vice president at that time. Oh. He was vice president. So talk is cheap. We are not going to expose them before Nigerians. They're not going to escape this time. What we want to do is to drag them to the statistics. Yeah, but the issue we, is, we are, we are not what, going what would you be to, telling Nigerians? Because Nigerians are actually See, the ones bearing the brunt. And they know the current realities. I want to say something about the, more about food security he's talking yes, about. In terms of hunger. In, yes, you know, in terms I, of I want the, to talk more about that. Right. Do you know that 60% mm. of what we eat, 60% of our earnings go to food? 60%. That's the statistics given all over the world. Is so, it the current, so, the no, current no, situation the or before now? No, 60% of our earnings okay. virtually go to food. Why should so in it other go words, to food? So, so in other words, mm. food itself adds mm. a lot to the GDP. Okay? And uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a major component mm. of the inflation rates. Yeah. So when food goes up, mm. it affects the, the inflation rate a lot. Mm. Now, if we had not been importing, if we are still be importing rice, mm. if we are not almost self-sufficient in rice production now, that means the, this government was had foresight enough to quickly go back to agriculture. By now, it would have been the same trouble, the same problem that we have in Egypt. Egypt was depending on import of wheat exclusive, and that's the staple food from Ukraine and Russia. Now, Egypt is in a mess. If we have been depending on importation of rice, if the government was not foresighted enough to quickly go back to agriculture and make sure we are sufficient in rice production, by now, the inflation, because it, like I said, it's a component of inflation, mm -hmm. by now, that inflationary rate will have been more than 19% that we are seeing today. And at 19%, let me tell you, the movement has been 6%. That 19% you talked about today, yes, we gained 1% upwards, but the movement between 2020 2022 or 2020 when this problem started, I mean the um, COVID-19, is still a movement of 6%. The lowest you have in Europe and the entire world is about 7%, the lowest. So we are still doing lower than the lowest. European countries are doing 10% to 12%. Between then and now, they have recorded 12% movement mm. in inflationary rate. Yeah. So I want uh, to let you know that even mm. though it appears grim, 19% appears grim, mm. but it is still the effort of government that has kept it this low because the food component, mm. food component is not part of that inflation. Mm. If food, we have been importing food, it would have been a big mess. Mm. And then two months ago, mm. the government also made, the president also gave a directive that we should open up our, our, our silos. Mm. So... All our strategic grain has, reserves uh, that, that, have been that, that released in the last two the months. Situation in terms of the pricing, uh, you know, we're talking about almost thirty eight thousand naira uh, per. I mean, uh, yes, uh, thirty thousand yes, naira a, per bag. Yes, price. yes, we must feel for the the, the, the poor and the common man. Mm. But if we have been importing, how much would rice have been by now? With these problems in the world, mm. when local production is at that amount, mm. how much would it have been by now? 
That's the question we should ask ourselves. Okay. So, so yes. in terms of, like I said, mm -hmm. all the attempts for them to drag Nigeria out of mm -hmm. the world economic situation and the macroeconomic indexes all over the world, mm -hmm. we will drag Nigeria back there mm -hmm. and tell them where Nigeria is within that index. Okay. We will tell them. Okay. Yes. Still talking economy, for instance. Yes. Your principal, if you like, or the your presidential candidate talking yes. about. Uh, Senator Bola Amatinubu just recently rolled out a blueprint, you know, uh, on his um, agenda for the economy. And he was talking about um, raising the GDP. Which one did you see? The I one mean, about two weeks ago? Yeah. No, it's not authorized by us. Okay. We, we sat down. Look, it's not authorized, so we can't quote from that document. Uh, we are still tweaking the real document mm. to be released. I think somebody out of exuberance released that document. So mm. I sat down yeah, with Ashwaju. Yeah, I, I sat down with about... some two weeks ago and said, that is not authorized. Mm. Okay, but let me just give you mm. a snippet of what, mm. how the presidential candidate is thinking. Mm. He's also thinking along the line of food security and agriculture. Mm. And that is why some people, when I see them and they make fun of him, because he's always talking about our staple food, he said, Agbado, mm. uh, cassava, Agba. That is a presidential candidate talking about food security. Mm. What should he talk about if he doesn't talk about Gary? Mm. Cassava is Gary. Agbado is the major grain that is, and you have a lot of byproducts from, you know, Agbado, which is corn in Yoruba. Mm -hmm. So when he's talking about cassava, Agbado, he is in fact talking about food security. It's a euphemism for food security. That means he's forward thinking more than any other presidential candidate that we have around. I don't okay. know whether there's enough time. I wanted to put a well, presidential candidate on a scale we will, and other ones we will on a have, scale uh, today. enough time to do that. Uh, you well, know, <laughs> this is a continuous conversation. Yes, I hope you but invite I, me back I, for that. Yes, I have to go back to uh, Mr. Bwala. Uh, of course, we are rounding up uh, for perhaps to get his, uh, uh, his uh, final yes. thoughts. Let me, let, uh, Mr. Bwala, you've had uh, Barista Keyamo talking about, you know, how the government is struggling to fix the economy in spite of the challenges, the global uh, challenges and the dynamics we are talking about. And he was also talking about, I mean, accusing you of not understanding, if you like, uh, the current, um, I mean, realities with regards to Nigeria, I mean, how Nigeria interplay uh, in the global economy of, of assault. Uh, how would you respond to that? Right. So uh, it is quite uh, intriguing and laughable when he was responding to the issue of oil. And he said the very fact that uh, there is increase in oil price means that a concomitant effect in the other value chain. So in other words, what they are trying to say that the increase of oil, when we make when we generate more revenue, is a cost. Sometimes it's difficult for you to be able to tell what exactly they mean when they speak. But let me tell you another point. On the 26th of February, 2015, here in London at the Royal Institute of uh, International Affairs, the Chatham House, President Mohammed Buhari told the world that the reason why there is insecurity in Nigeria was because PDP was spending money on politics rather than on security. He specifically said that they did not buy enough ammunition for the soldiers and they did not motivate. He rounded his conversation that day by saying that if he's voted into power, the world will have no reason to worry about Nigeria because he will end, I'm quoting, he will end Boko Haram and all other criminal vices in the country. This is seven years after he made that statement. Now, both Boko Haram situation has now metamorphosed. So if they say they suppress Boko Haram, but there are multiplier effects in the rest of the country, it means their type of movement is one step forward and five step backwards. Let me tell you in case you don't know, after he told the world, so this is how you assess after seven years. We have spent arguably about six point something trillion generally in the past seven years on defense. It means he has spent more money than what he accused Jonathan on, on defense. Yet, there is no result. You wonder why? Let me tell you. Erufai, the governor of Kaduna State, recently wrote a letter to the president and he said that the bandits are somewhere in Kaduna trying to establish an alternative government, a parallel government, that they are collecting taxes and they have even issued a threat that there will be no election in 2023. Kaduna, between Kaduna and Abuja, these bandits have extorted about 1.1 billion from innocent Nigerian people under this abduction and the recovery. Garba Shehu was quoted to have said 
that the government is disillusioned because everything the bandit had asked for, they have given those bandits, yet the bandits have failed in their promises. In other words, this bandit even have more trust in ordinary citizens in negotiating abductees and releasing them than in the government who will give them everything they wanted and yet will not release abductees to the government, if I go by what Garbashiwi is saying. And these same, these same bandits were the ones that killed the soldiers in the guards brigade. These same bandits said they were going to abduct the president of the country after they have also attacked the advanced team of presidential uh, convoy. Now, the spokesperson of uh, APC was asked, and he said that why should we take serious what the bandits said about abducting the president, mm. that they were mere yes. comedians. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. The Bola. comedians that I know, mm. can I learn, please, sir? Uh, very quickly, because of time, please. Yeah. Uh, Bovi, mm. right, go ahead. Okay, yes, you, you, you read something fundamental about perhaps the security, I mean, corruption in the security sector. You are making reference to the allegation of the 2.1 trillion or thereabout during the Jonathan administration that was said to have been, I mean, shared among, you know, uh, party chieftains and what have you in the, in the build up to 2015 election. Uh, you are also accusing the cur current administration of spending over 4 trillion naira uh, without result. Um, well, Mr. Kiyama will perhaps respond to that. But you also agreed, you admit the fact that, okay, the security situation has also um, escalated beyond, you know, the Boko Haram that was inherited. Uh, didn't you think that may perhaps require more funding uh, than what it used to be? And again, the government keeps saying that, uh, it is what is it is spending in the security sector is visible. Uh, for instance, the platforms that were acquired, you know, the aircrafts and what have you, uh, are there to be seen. Uh, let me see. Let me get your response very quickly, and that, that will be a last line. Uh, let me get that uh, from you. Okay. Well, when I talk, I quote them. I don't talk about what we say. I'm talking about what they say. The president of Nigeria recently said that he is fed up because he has paid. He has given all the logistics and the finances that the security agencies need to fight this insurgent and he wonders why they could not bring the result. You remember, after the jailbreak, he appeared in Fuji and said, I am disappointed with intelligence. Nobody paid for it. When they threatened they were going to abduct him, you would have thought that the government would take decisive steps to end this insurgent. So all we are saying is that excuses of, we inherited this, we inherited that, will not work because you did not inherit banditry. If you say you inherited Boko Haram, and look at the Niger Delta, look at the Southeast. They have, in fact, failed in their promises on security. They have failed woefully in their promises on the economy. And the, you only need to see the stats and the facts. And they have also failed in the fight against corruption. You haven't asked me, but let me just close by telling you that just even today, the final report on the EMCC said that about 114 or so billion fraud cases were abandoned by the former chair. And I think about 40 something billion again could not be remitted. You look, you remember the accountant general. And there are interventions, this intervention, this is my final point, this in various interventions, social intervention of the government, including the 50, 52 billion mm -hmm. that was voted for the execution of the 774 local government of uh, uh, Nigerian people. Mm -hmm. If you probe further all the interventions, when these individuals who claim to be executing it were summoned by the National Assembly for Accountability, mm -hmm. what happened? They almost resulted into right. physical uh, fistocope at uh, every given time. Okay. They brought okay. humanitarian, okay. they brought the social investment, right. all of them. They rejected uh, it because okay. these things right. are waste. Okay. Uh, okay, let me get your last line. You've had it. Take him on the issue yes, of no, leadership no, no, accountability. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 your no, last no, no. line. Yeah. Don't, don't pigeonhole me one by one. Uh, oh, I'm sure I'm sure he's from yeah. the south and he's from the northeast. Mm. And I'm sure his people in Meduguri are listening to him and laughing at him now. Because he's saying that the situation in the Northeast has escalated. Mm -hmm. I don't know when he went back home. But the people in the Northeast will respond with their votes mm -hmm. if he says they are, you know. And again, mm -hmm. he said uh, we have spent 6.1 trillion naira in yeah. um, uh, security uh, matters. Yeah. When did yeah. Jonathan spend 2.1? Mm -hmm. what, where did Jonathan's 2.1 trillion naira go to? It went to private pockets. Mm -hmm. It went to elections. Mm -hmm. Where did our 6.1 trillion naira go to? It went to Tucano Jets. It went to equipment. So go and take statistics of equipment in the store now mm. and take statistics of equipment in the mm. store during Jonathan's time. There was no equipment during Jonathan's time. But we all know that the Tucano jets are coming, have come in. Mm. And let me tell people about the operation of some of these equipment. Mm. Before they sell equipment to you, mm. your international 
you know, uh, sellers will tell you mm. that these are the rules of engagement. If you use them against human rights, mm. we will not sell to you again. Yeah, I, and look, look, you yeah. gave him three yeah, million. I understand. You gave him time. Issue you gave him time. You gave him, no, don't, don't, uh, okay. don't pipe the pilot. Give him time to, yeah. to say his last word. Let me say yeah. my last oh, word. Okay. Okay. okay? Mm. And so they will tell you that there are rules of engagement. Mm. If you now take those to Kano Jet and go and wipe out bandits and when they are holding hostages mm -hmm. and you wipe out civilians openly they will not sell equipments to you again and that's why the government i just want to let nigerians know why the government is going about the way they are going about with the kidnappers the president said so recently and guess what almost all the people have been released now that is a sensible government you don't go and wipe all of them out the next day and kill innocent people there too so there are rules of engagement when they sell these equipment to you mm -hmm. so just to reply you we have yeah. equipments equipments equipment to show for the 6.1 trillion yeah. jonathan had nothing but politics to show yeah. for a 2.1 trillion. He talked about now, corruption. You know, I talked about in, in now, this the fact that yeah. even these tales of corruption, they are coming out. Mm -hmm. It's a fact that the government is fighting its own service. It's, it's fighting corruption within the system. If government were not to be fighting corruption, you will not hear any of this. Do you understand know, time? Did you hear about the corruption in the security sector? You know, it was the next government that brought them out. Did you hear about God, the, 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 the corruption? of the oil sector with Desiani and her allies? Did you hear of them during Jonathan's time? No. It was in this government that brought them out. But this is a government that is purging itself and purging its own officials of corruption. That is kudos. That is kudos to government. Mm. Because it is not that corruption will not happen in any government. Mm. Nobody will tell you that corruption will not happen. Mm. It is your ability to fight it, mm. to expose it, and to punish those who have been found guilty of corruption. Mm. I prosecuted for the EFC for well, 15 years. Mm. And I know the difference between then, under Jonathan, and now. Okay. The, the files right. then were gathering All dust. Right. Yeah. Dust under Jonathan's time, okay. under the PDP time. Right. They were not prosecuting cases. Okay, I wish so we could go on, uh, you know, but it's you know, so, uh, yeah, but yes. time, time. Yeah, okay. so just there was one last point that he, that yeah, he yeah, also okay. raised. You can respond so, to that very quickly. Um, I think he talked about um, um, food security or so. I've forgotten. Yeah, there was issues around, you know, food security and why, I mean, with all the, the spendings, you know. Nigeria yes, he was talking to, about, he said, we don't, yeah. we don't, he doesn't understand what we're talking about in the terms of the oil sector. Yeah. Yeah, Why prices are yeah. going up. Yeah. So, and I think all the players in the oil sector, mm -hmm. they are now seeing that a major spokesperson of the opposition does not understand the politics of oil and the international trade of oil. They don't. He said, we are saying these things. When the prices are going up, in the international market, even though we, we are a major producer of crude oil, because we still are still import dependent, the byproducts that come in, we naturally go up. It's a very simple thing. He said he doesn't understand what we are saying. Well, and that is what is going on. And production has come down, yeah. if you yeah. don't know. Production, we are the ones managing production more. Yeah. With a very low production of about a million barrels per day. Let me tell you, that's what we're doing. Mm. Because of oil theft oh, yeah. in the Niger Delta so, region. We're talking about oil theft, you know. Yes. That's another, another yes. issue altogether. Yes. Well, okay. Uh, we, I wish we and with all on. the refineries we mm. have approved of now, mm -hmm. with the private refineries mm -hmm. that we have approved of, it is the next government that will benefit from all of these initiatives that we have taken. Okay. Nigerians are looking forward to see the impact of the, uh, you know, the interventions and the policies you have been running. Uh, thank you very much, Barista Professor. Uh, Keyamo, SAN, for talking to us. And also, thank you very much, uh, 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 Barista you know, uh, Daniel Buala, for joining us all the way from London. We appreciate your perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. On the behalf of my guests and, of course, the technical crew, this is where we come to the end of this program. Do join us sometime tomorrow. We'll be back with another topic and personalities. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day.